You're listening to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. All Hit Radio. Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back, everyone. This is the X Zone. I am Rob McConnell, and we're coming to you live and around the world from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Worldwide toll-free, 1-800-610-7035. Email exxon at exxonradiotv.com. On all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And our main website where you can listen to the Exxon, 724-365, www.exxonradiotv.com. My guest this hour, Exxon Nation, is Frank DeMarco. He was the co-founder of Hampton Roads Publishing Company and for 16 years was chief editor. He is the author of seven other non-fiction books, including Muddy Tracks, Chasing Smallwood, The Sphere and the Hologram, The Cosmic Internet, Afterlife Conversations with Hemingway, A Place to Stand, Imagine Yourself Well, and two novels, Messenger, a sequel to The Lost Horizon, and Babe in the Woods. His past and current thinking may be found on his blog, I of My Own Knowledge, on Everyday's Explorations into the Extraordinary Potential. His website is hologrambooks.com. And Frank DeMarco, welcome back to the x How are you, Frank? I'm doing well. How about yourself, Frank? Excellent. Thank you, Frank. Uh, tell us about your new book, Rita's World. Well, Rita's World... Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Sure. A little water might need something a little stronger than water. It's all, it's all right if you're if you're uh, pouring Jack Daniels. I'll be glad to take one with you. <laughs> um, the story goes back away, um, back in huh, Rob. I, you hear that echo in the background? No, no, I don't hear any echo at all. All right. Well, if I'm a little disjointed, that's why because I'm here myself. Um, Rita Warren was. A, Ph.D. academic, mm-hmm. in, um, took early retirement, went down to Bob Monroe's Monroe Institute, and she ran the consciousness lab there for four years. I met her several years later. She was uh, already 80 years old. Boy, this is... Um, well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to we're going to run a commercial and we're going to try and reconnect with you. How's that sound? That would be better. Yeah. All right, Frank. Please stand by. Exxon Nation. Frank DeMarco is our guest for this hour. www.hologrambooks.com. That's www.hologrambooks.com. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell, and we'll be back when we uh, bring Frank back on after this short commercial break. First of all, let's start off by getting the following understood. I am not a psychic, medium, channel, intuitive, soothsayer, nor the practitioner of any art of divination. I am a Canadian, a broadcaster, a journalist, a publisher, and a realist. I tried warning people about the refugee problem with on-air commentaries and videos that I had produced, but no one listened. I was called a racist, and every name under the sun... Well, look what happened in Paris on Friday, Friday the 13th, 2015. The X-Zone was the first media outlet to openly make the Friday 13th connection and was the first media outlet to broadcast the fact that ISIS had claimed responsibility for the terror in the attacks on Paris. This is war. I hate to say it, but it is going to get worse before it gets better. 
My heart and prayers are with those who have lost family, friends, and countrymen and women in this war that ISIS has openly declared, again, against the Western world. The time for talking is over. We must support France and other free countries against Islam. We must close our borders to Syrian refugees. Again, we need to give refugees a safe zone in Syria by a military coalition where they can live and be protected and supported by the United Nations until the time comes when ISIS and their supporters and sympathizers have been wiped off the face of this earth, at which time the refugees from Syria can return to their homeland. The military and intelligence services must be given all the resources they need to fight this fight. It is time we stopped turning the other cheek and started fighting fire with fire. This is no time to be over-politically correct. For the Exxon Radio and TV show in the X Chronicles newspaper, I am Rob McConnell. All right, welcome back, everyone. Hopefully we have Frank DeMarco back with us. Frank, are you there? I'm here. Let's see if the echo is here. The echo is not here. There you go. Technology is great when it works, my friend. All right, so tell us about Rita's world. Well, um, uh, you know what? The echo is right there again. I'm sorry. Hmm. Well, we don't know what to do at this point. Our engineer is saying that everything is nice and clear here. Um, well, let me try and do as best I can. All righty. Rita and I were friends. She was about uh, 26 years older than I was, and she had had a distinguished career. She was a, a, in psychology. Mm-hmm. She was actually distinguished enough that she was on the President's Commission for Violence way back in uh, 1968. She was really well-known at that day. Then um, she took a, a gateway at the Monroe Institute, and it, it really blew her away. She took early retirement, came down. Bob Monroe gave her the keys to the consciousness lab and said, here, you know, um, you run it. So she did that for several years. What that amounts to is um, people go into an altered state by means of, of a, a sound technology that puts them there. Mm-hmm. And they're in a uh, shielded environment which protects them from sensory uh, input so they can get really fine. That's yeah, Frank, we're having one heck of a time. Rita would if Frank w- sessions with, with them, and in those days people could do it for nothing, and mm-hmm. some people did several. One woman did as many as 100, but most people did a few. If they didn't have, if they ran through their own personal agenda, Rita had questions about what's the other side like, and, and you know, what's life after death, mm-hmm. and all the questions that we all have, and she would try and ask them. And what often happened was she got very unsatisfactory answers. Um, you know, they would say, well, it's, it's fine, everything's good, you, you know, you, it's hard to explain, which left her very frustrated. Well, she retired in 84 from that, and it was another 16 years before we met. And, gosh, I'm sorry, just the explanation goes on this long, but that's what happened. Um, I started doing a series of, of altered state sessions with her. I would go over to her house. She would have all these queued up questions. And she would ask me the questions, and I would be lying there in an altered state, and I would answer the questions. Now, consciously, I didn't know the answers to any of these things, but, you know, you learn there is a technique where you just learn to let it come through, and, and the information comes, and then you see what you come up with. Well, we did that. We did weekly sessions for five months, and eventually we put, I put the uh, transcripts of those sessions, because I taped them all, I put the transcripts into a book called Sphere and the Hologram. That book didn't come out until Rita had already died. She died in March of 2008, and the book came out later that month, that year. But I thought, well, you know, it was really a wonderful experience, and, and it, was, it was a lovely relationship, and I thought that was the end of it until December. And last December I had a dream that said she was ready to start working for me again, working with me again. So I sat up in the morning, and I got my journal, and I wrote a question. I said, okay, are you ready? If you're ready, I'm ready. And she started to come in, and, and for the next six months, almost every morning, that's what would happen. I would have a session with her, and, and all this information came through. So, so tell me, how do you, how, you know, how did you learn how to talk to the dead? It's, 
it's one of those things that you might say is actually easier done than said. Most of the things that stop people from doing it are not so much stopping them from doing it, it's stopping mm-hmm. them from recognizing that they're doing it. Um, I know that, that may seem um, improbable, but people have input all the time, but they usually say, well, I just made that up, or, or you know, well, it's just imagination. It's an easy thing to actually learn to do, and I think I saw a survey somewhere that said that within a year of their spouse's death, something like 70% of the people in this one survey from Gallup said that they had felt they had had some kind of communication from their deceased spouse. I'm not sure that was always good, but, you know, another story. So let me see. uh, How long did you actually talk to Rita? Uh, for, during these breakfast meetings, you said six months. And what was the main topic of conversation when you sat down and you talked to her from your side to the other side? Well, the interesting thing is she had her whole agenda. And, you know, she had been asking all those questions about what's it like from this side. Then she crosses over and she still has a relationship with me. So now she's saying, OK, I can tell you some of the things that I would have liked to have known. And, and what were they? Well, for instance, she starts off with very simple things. Let me, let me read you a session. Sure, please. A session that we had. Hold on a sec. She said, we're going to begin in a place that will perhaps surprise you, telling you what you think you already know, but hang on for the ride and see. The first statement, this side and the other side are in continuous, unbroken communication, regardless what it feels like to those in body. Some, like you, won't find anything to object to in that statement, but in fact, in day-to-day living, in ideas as expressed in action, few, if any, live that reality. In fact, in actual living, you live as though communication exists only when you intend it or are aware of it. This is not good or bad. It's how the experience, it's how the separation of 3D life leads you Mm -hmm. to experience or not experience that aspect of life but your life is bounded by your expectations of life, and we're interested in expanding those expectations. The idea that there could be a separation between physical and non-physical stems from the idea that different substances involved in either realm. As you were told pretty much right away in our 2001 sessions, there is no difference between beings in the physical and in the non-physical, except in the, to the condition of the terrain each is on. Now, that's a lot to have heard rather than read. And, uh, does that make sense? <coughs> Excuse me. Yes, it does. So how do you, where does reincarnation fit into the big picture? Well, reincarnation as it is mostly understood doesn't really fit into this picture in the same way. This picture is, you could say, um, those of us who come into a lifetime are could be considered two ways. You could be considered as a con- continuation of the spirit that you were, mm-hmm. but you're also something unique because you are a unique mixture of certain traits and certain uh, trends that were uh, threads. I mean, that were put together in a, in a certain time in a certain place to create a certain kind of a person, which is us. So it, a lot of this, in fact, most of what she's giving me, depends on the, which way you want to look at it. But the fact that it can be looked at two different ways is an important change in itself. Uh, as manifestations of spirit, mm-hmm. we're always, in a sense, the same, or we're part of the same larger thing. But as manifestations of individual souls, we are the, the particularly biased individuals that we were created to be. So tell me, Frank, what is the most interesting thing that you have learned about the the afterlife or the other side? Well, I think the, the, the main thing is that we on this side and the after side and the afterlife are not only the same thing, the afterlife is all around us. In fact, it's probably a misnomer to call it an afterlife. It's, it's another part of life. Mm -hmm. You and I right now exist in the non-physical as well as in the physical because it's the only place that there is. Um, now that may need a little explanation, I suppose. If you, I think some people think that heaven has a zip code, you know, that, that it's a different geographical place. 
and and it isn't. I mean, the physical world exists within the non-physical world. We extend to it. We live from it. We are created by it. So that's a whole different way of looking at life. In fact, we'll go a little further than that. They've told us the 3D world, with its unique conditions of limitation, was created for a specific reason. There are things that can be done here that cannot be done in the non-physical. And, uh, and I can go into that if you wish. Yes, please. Yeah, I'd, I'd love for you to go into that because that, that is the key to, I would imagine, the difference between uh, this life and the other life. Well, you see, if 3D density world can be considered as an experiment that was put together by them or maybe, maybe a workshop, we, have, we live, as you well know, under certain conditions, we live in the perception of separation. You know, we don't feel like you and I are the same thing. We don't feel like here and Pennsylvania is mm -hmm. the same place. We live in separation of time, and, and we only are on this one minute, and the minute moves along and it moves us forward. You know, and you can think about the past and you can think about the future, but you can't physically live anywhere except right where you are. Okay, so those are those are major conditions of limitation, but they're there for a reason. And they say what happens is we are created as call us a ring or, or a bundle, and we have all of these threads, all these potential traits that we could experience or that we could manifest. The physical world comes at us one moment at a time, and we're always on that moment. So we are continually having to make choices, and by by the way we choose. It determines what we're going to become, and that's important for them on the other side. You see, uh, we are creating a mind. We're creating what they would call a habit system mm -hmm. that persists after the body's gone. The body is is the the purpose of the body is to hold us in one place and one time, and concentrate our attention so that we make those choices in sort of isolation. Then after that, we're part of this great vast library out there, or. Perhaps we should call it a, a college. I don't know. A series of, of minds that are, you could consider them one mind with many, many pieces, or you could consider them many minds all, all put together. Those are just definitions. But it's, it's the, the 3D world mm -hmm. that helps to, uh, shall we say, complicate their world because, because lives can be lived here in conditions that can't be lived there, which then provides them something that they can get to so tell me, Frank, um, are you afraid of death now? Why would I be? Well, why are most people afraid of death? I think many people are afraid of death because they're afraid that, the, that it's the end of things and that their life is useless hmm. or their life is uh, wasted, let's put it that way. Other people are afraid because they don't know what's coming. It's like, I can't think of a good analogy offhand, but you know, Anything that's coming and you know it's coming has that certain air of, of oh, God, you know, i got to go through this. Right. Oh, i got a good analogy in, in a way. Uh, I, in fact, I've heard of women who were on the, the childbirth table and they were saying, I don't think I want to go through with this. <laughs> well, you don't have a whole lot of choice at that point. Yeah. I think it's that I don't have any choice on being carried along that scares people as much as anything else. And that and the, and the uncertainty is what's coming. It's just like that old joke where a lady goes down and sits in a dentist chair and she says, oh, my God, I think I'd rather be having a baby than having my tooth felt. And the dentist says, well, you better make up your mind before I tilt the chair. <laughs> Frank, what is the most important message that Rita has given you that, that you would want to give to other people? I think... More than any other thing, the fact that the physical world is here for a purpose and that we are here for a purpose and people's lives are not useless, they're not wasted, they're not, um, they're not tragic in the sense that we sometimes think of them. Many years ago, in fact, Rita and I did a session on the night of September the 11th of 2001, and she asked some really hard questions, as you can mm -hmm. imagine, that night. But what they said is, all is well, all is always well. And that has challenged a lot of people over the years. But I think as they look at it more, they realize, hey, there's something to that. If you're in a movie 
and it's a very uh, uh, enthralling movie, you are experiencing all the emotions of that movie, but it's not real at the same level as the rest of your life is real. I think we would say that our lives, in our physical lives, are not real as our non-physical lives are. So therefore, the tragedy that is real at this level is not real at another level. Beyond that, there are things you can do mm -hmm. here. There are things you can do only here. And, and after you're dead, it's too late, so probably it would be a good time to, to get cracking on them now. Talking about working our own, uh, creating our own, um, well, our mind, our soul, whichever, however you would want to say it. A lot of that stuff is out of fashion these days, but uh, fashions don't really have much to do with reality. Not usually. No, not usually. All right, stand by, Frank. You and I have to take a commercial break. We'll be right back as we go to our network news. Exo Nation, Frank DeMarco is our special guest. www.hologrambooks.com. That's www.hologrambooks.com. And we'll be back on the other side of this news break as we continue here in the Exo from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Worldwide toll-free, 800-610-7035. Email exxon at exxonradiotv.com on all social media sites, exxon Radio TV, And our main radio website where you can listen to the Exxon, 724-365, as well as during the live broadcast, Monday through Friday from 8 p.m. Eastern until midnight at www.exxonradiotv.com. Once again, for more information on Frank DeMarco, visit his website, Holograms Book, Hologram Books, plural, dot com. My name is Rob McConnell. I'll be back after this news break. Don't go away. Listening to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting, broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. I'm William S. Peckham. If you enjoy a good mystery with a touch of the paranormal, then you'll love my novel, From Out of the Woodwork. It's the story of a young Toronto contractor, Sean Kennedy, who buys derelict homes, guts them, and turns them into multifamily dwellings. Slums just waiting to happen. When Sean buys 29 Livery Lane, the house fights back. Former owners unexpectedly come out of the woodwork as he starts the destruction. The apparitions come to him when he touches old books, reads hidden letters, rummages through old boxes, finds a locket or reads a discovered manuscript of a murder mystery. From Out of the Woodwork will take you from 1899 to the horror of the World Trade Center, September 11, 2001. Check out From Out of the Woodwork on my website, www.williamspeckham.com. Modern Esoteric, Beyond Our Senses by Brad Olson, consummates the lifeology story about where humanity originates. It is the lost continents, the primitive wisdom, the mythos of creation, and the rethinking of ancient history as we are taught in academia. There is much more to the story than what we have been told. As this is the first book in the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric starts at the beginning of time and accelerates up to this modern age. Future Esoteric is book two in the series and takes a forward-looking position ahead of today with an open and honest examination of the ET issue and various unexplained phenomena. To discover the writings of author Brad Olson, visit www.bradolson.com. That's www.bradolson.com.
With each new extreme weather event or terrorist act, it becomes increasingly obvious that we live in uncertain and challenging times. We all buy car insurance. Why not collapse and catastrophe insurance? Matthew Stein, an MIT-trained engineer and green builder, has written two outstanding books to help people prepare, plan for, and deal with everything from minor situations lasting a few days to full-on collapse. Matt's first book, When Technology Fails, is a manual for self-reliance, sustainable living, and surviving the long emergency. This massive book covers the gamut from first aid and emergency preparedness to alternative healing, renewable energy, primitive living skills, and 18th century technologies that could be critical to your comfort and survival in a long-lasting crisis. Matt's second book, When Disaster Strikes, is a comprehensive emergency preparedness handbook and survival guide. When Disaster Strikes is an essential item for every family's go bag. Both books are available at all usual sources. There's a wealth of totally free information posted at whentechfails.com and author signed copies may be purchased at mattstein.com. That's www.whentechfails.com and www.mattstein.com. Do you think you have energy problems in your home? Do you feel better when you're away than when you're home? Joey Korn is a global leader in the world of dowsing who specializes in personal energy clearing and space clearing. He can help you create an ideal energy environment in your home no matter where you live in the world. Learn about his remote spiritual house cleaning services and much more at www.dowsers.com. You can get Joey's book, Dowsing, A Path to Enlightenment, as well as other dowsing books and tools, Kabbalah books, and Walter Russell books. Joey's work is really amazing. Go to dowsers.com right now. That's D-O-W-S-E-R-S dot com or call 1-877-DOWSING. That's 1-877-369-7464. Whether you're a skeptic or a believer, join me, Rob McConnell, as together we'll investigate the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology here in the X-Zone, a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. The X-Zone is a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. The X-Zone radio show is broadcast live from our Hamilton, Ontario broadcast center, Monday through Friday from 8 p.m. until midnight Eastern, right here on the X-Zone broadcast network and on our worldwide family of radio broadcast and satellite programming affiliates. UFOs, aliens, ghosts, hauntings, Bigfoot, lake monsters, unsolved mysteries, conspiracies, cover-ups, and much more. So plan to join me, Rob McConnell, right here in the X-Zone on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net, or listen to the X-Zone Radio Show archives 24-7, 365, and the live broadcast at www.xzoneradiotv.com. Welcome back, everyone. Frank DeMarco is our special guest. Uh, Frank was the co-founder of Hampton Roads Publishing Company and for 16 years was chief editor. His website, www.hologrambooks.com. That's www.hologrambooks.com. Frank, um, what does the world of the living appear for people, you know, after death? Uh, you know, is it like we've heard or we've been told where everybody sits on a cloud in this white gown and plays a harp? Uh, no, today they don't play harps. Today they play uh, uh, electronic organs. <laughs> Otherwise, yes, exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> but what's it really like? The, the, 
Now, I'm going to have to apologize again for this because what I'm doing, having to hold my, my hand over the earpiece so okay. I don't hear the echo. So if my if my uh, words don't make any sense, there's more excuse for it than usual. <laughs> the The afterlife, if you would think of it as pr- primarily... Okay, how do we go about this? If you don't have senses, what is left? And what is left is primarily consciousness. Um, that consciousness is not filtered through senses, therefore it is not um, limited. But you come into that, you're, you're now in a situation where you are one mind among many other minds, and you can communicate with any of the minds that you want by having an affinity with them. I'm not really sure after all this time what makes them more conscious or less conscious on Mm -hmm. their side. I do know that when we can connect with them, it's like they get a little bit of extra energy from our connection. They seem to like that, actually. It's it's like like lighting up their their consciousness a little bit. The, The way they described it to me is on the other side you have a vast consciousness that is just just cosmic in extent but it is not as pointed it is not as bright and special as it is here in uh, in earth because here we have as i said we're we're all balanced in that one moment of light mm-hmm. one moment of of time i mean and that concentrates us in a way that that they're not concentrated so for instance you and i are talking right now we are right here. Even if our mind is wandering, we're right here. And where we were in 1955 or where we were in 1995 is not nearly as present as right here. I mean, it's designed that way, and that's how it works. They don't have that, and they can move back and forth in time and throughout their memories and throughout their, their connections with others any way they want. The downside of it for them is it's not as intense as we are. The upside is it's much more wide and connected. Well, if you can imagine yourself, as you are today, Rob, um, going on to the other side and functioning there, your mind is the same mind that it is now. Your your combination of traits, your character traits, your everything that you built in the course of your life by your decisions it exists there. Now, you're not going to be building a house. You're not going to be going to a restaurant. You're not going to have to go to to work. So what do you do with your time? What do you spend it on? You spend it on the things that are important. And those things have, well, it's a couple of levels. One level is the interacting with others. A second level is interacting with those of us here in the physical because it does have a a sort of a value to this. Mm -hmm. Now, we've asked many times for a better description of what it is they do. And the very first time we asked, what do you do on the other side? The, the only answer we got was, we relate. And you know, this was back when Rita was alive, and Rita and I sort of looked at each other like, okay, well, that's very helpful. What does that mean? But, but Rita has been able to expand that in, in her talks with me. And what, she mean, what it means is, if you are still a consciousness and a personality, and you have, um, um, shall we say, um, Hard to find a word for it, but you know how you're sort of pulled towards some things that you're interested in? Sure. Yeah. That would be the equivalent. Well, now you're there without any physical constraints to do that. But there are other levels above it which we do not know about. They won't, they haven't really, they've said one thing at a time, basically. So it isn't like the whole world is this world plus the other world on one level. There are structures above that, and which are, you know, above our pay grade. So what is our purpose of being? Why are we here? And where does it start and where does it end? We are here according to the scheme that they gave us because there are two kinds of beings in the, in the non-physical world. And one are the beings that have been described like angels that are um, they're, they're created and they stay the way they are all the time. Mm-hmm. But the other are created in physical world, which is why the physical world was created through sexual reproduction, which means two strands coming together to form a new strand. Only go back, go far beyond one generation. You are the product of all the generations from as far back as, you know, whoever. And I don't know what the limit is. I don't know what the practical limit is. But you have two sets of 
heredity. You have your physical heredity, and you have what you might call your soul's heredity. You know, if you had other lives, those feed in there. Well, you are a quite complex being that have more twists and turns to your personality than, than the equivalent of the angels would be. They're always the same thing. We're not. We change. In fact, humans, you might think of us as the trickster in the universe. We're the ones who who create the the movement in the universe. That's what I gather anyway. That may not be quite... All right, but if... If it doesn't make sense, just say so and we'll try and, and go some more. But. All right, I'm trying to understand our reason is for reproductive. If we're all spirit, why would the reproduction be the purpose? Rob? Yeah, I'm here. The, the question I was asking was that, you know, if we are, if our purpose is to reproduce, and if we are spirit, really, why is the emphasis put on reproduction? It's not so much reproduction as it is production of new kinds of spirit. New kinds of see. Okay, we have to make a distinction between spirit and soul. We okay. all are. We are all spirit. That's what we are. Mm-hmm. But you could consider a soul to be something formed of a certain bunch of traits in a certain time in a certain place, making those decisions. So Rob McConnell is a soul. Rob McConnell's spiritual force for you know your ancestors and all the things that mm-hmm. go into you is a different thing. But there's only one Rob. And there's only one connection just like you that ever was or ever could be because the conditions will never be the same. Right. That is the purpose. That's what they said is anyway the main purpose of physical life, to produce more complicated beings which then function in the other side. You know, it isn't like we have an afterlife that is an afterthought. Mm -hmm. We are really functioning up there day to day. And I I suspect we're functioning even while we are down here as well, but I don't know that. But, but the whole purpose is, in physical life, you can produce more complicated beings that then can add more complexity to the other side. Frank, what are your, what are your thoughts on near-death experiences? Well, um, I take that to just be a um, temporary glimpse as to what's coming. I mean, uh, we call them near death only because people came back, but mm-hmm. a lot of them, I mean, they were just dead. Like my friend George Ritchie was, well, he was just gone and they, they knew it. He came back only, I forget how many minutes later, but it was long enough that he should have been brain dead and he, he should have had, you know, irreparable damage. Well, it, it, it didn't happen. The, the person who comes back from a near death experience as far as I know, none of them ever have, again, fear of death. None of them have um, undesirable consequences that I've ever heard of, anyway. They all come back and they realize the purpose of life is much more emotional than intellectual. You know, it's much more about love than it is about um, a- attaining things or, or about um, acquiring things. That tells me that it's a very profound and a very useful experience. As to why some people have them and some don't, I don't know. Why do you think there is such a large interest in the afterlife and death in the times that we're living in? Is it, is it because our world is in such a mess that we need something to look forward to, even if it is death? Well, my suspicion is, well, it's more than my suspicion. We've been told this, and I, and I, but I, I agree with it. I think it's just true. We are in the process of creating a new um, version of humanity. And and the old ways are dying, and it's very messy. Mm-hmm. But sometimes for a system to fail, it has to fail. And, and it's not going to look pretty, you know. People tried materialism. They tried the scientific uh, secularism. They tried ideology. They tried politics. All, none of those answers work. And it's, it's clear that they don't work. What's happening today, people are going in a couple of different directions. One direction leads people toward fundamentalism because they're so scared. Now, this may not be fair to them, but this is the way I see it. They're so scared, they want something to be absolutely true that they can believe without having to question themselves. So you go and you find an authority. Mm -hmm. 
and whatever it is that you decide is that authority, you take whatever they say and you don't have to think for yourself. But in, there's another set of people who are really out there exploring firsthand. And, and um, that was really the, the, the wonderful gift that I got out of the Monroe Institute back in 92, the first time I went there. They, they can give you the additional experiences, but they don't ever try and tell you what they mean. They say, well, you find out. You know, you go do it. Those people, the exploring people, are the ones who are saying, and, and I mean, I have to count myself in that category. Certainly, Rita was in that category. We're saying, okay, the conditions that we're living in have never been like this before. There must be a reason for that. And we are seeing that some of the um, the, the uh, handicaps or some of the, the restrictions that people have you always said were, were around aren't really true. So what's happening is right around us, everything's changing. Do you know that they discovered that the autistic kids show a terrific amount of telepathy? And autism has just exploded out of nowhere in the last year. People, or maybe mm -hmm. people have all kinds of different reasons, physical reasons why the autism has, has you know, suddenly made, become overwhelming with the epidemic. But what if it's actually a gift? What if it's actually a uh, transition? I have a friend who has an autistic child. He is sort of challenged dealing with the world, but what a loving individual he is. He's, he's very uh, intellectually open. I've heard that people who have uh, Down syndrome children, they just they just they love those kids to pieces because that's what they are. They're, they're pure love. That that may not seem to have anything to do with the question, but actually, no, it, it certainly does. Be last. Um, vestiges of an old civilization and the new civilization isn't formed yet. I mean, you and I will not live long enough to be formed but I think we're in one of the wonderful positions where you're seeing something new. I think it's a very hopeful time actually. I know most people are many people anyway care, or they're depressed mm -hmm. when you look at the, at the news but there's another way to look at it all and sometimes you know, a system has to fail in order to fail and you have to clear out the old stuff before you can bring in the new stuff. Frank, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight. I know that there's a problem with your with the line, and I sincerely appreciate you sticking by with us, my friend. We're going to bring you back on in a couple of weeks so that we can talk more about this because this is a very interesting topic. I want to hear more about Rita, and I also want to hear more about the other side. So, Frank, until then, thank you so much for joining us. A great pleasure talking to you again. And Exonation, if you'd like to find out more about Frank DeMarco, our guest this hour, visit him online at www. You got that? Hologrambooks.com. That's www.hologrambooks.com. I'll be back on the other side of this short break. And um, this is the Exon. It's a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard. We're here Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern. I'm sorry, from 8 p.m. Eastern. I'm still on the old time system. From 8 p.m. Eastern until midnight. Right here from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. My guest this hour has been Frank DeMarco. He was co-founder of Hampton Books Publishing Company and for 16 years was the chief editor. His website, www.hologrambooks.com. I'll be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. <laughs> 